Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Sean Hopwood, Associate Professor of Law at Georgetown Law Center and author of Law Man, My Story of Robbing Banks, Winning Supreme Court Cases, and Finding Redemption. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Sean. Thanks for having me. What is it like to rob a bank? Uh, everything in your body is telling you to get out of that bank. Uh, just think of like the most anxious anxiety-ridden moment of your life and then times that about about a hundred. Uh, and, and what's weird is, sitting here telling you now, I can't imagine going to do that now because uh, my life is so different. But 20 years ago, I was a much different person and very crazy and wild. And at the time, it sounded like a solution to some problems and turned out not so much. And your first bank robbery was, um, you tell in the book about dropping a um, toolbox, was that what it was? A toolbox. It was an interesting, it, was an interesting, it, was, it seemed like a very uh, advanced bank robbing strategy. <laughs> Actually, your whole first bank robbery seemed very advanced. Uh, it very gets, it advanced, gets less so. Very right? advanced for two young 20-year-olds who had no idea what they were doing. So uh, how, did they, how do you end up robbing a bank? Well, you mix in... Uh, some immaturity, no purpose. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Some depression, some alcohol and drugs, and a bunch of other young, stupid, immature 20-year-old men. And you combine that, and what came out was five armed bank robberies and me and five or six people robbing all of these banks together over the scope of a year. Were these banks near where you lived? No, they were, well, yes, they were all in eastern rural Nebraska, um, but they were all banks that were so small and, and the towns were so small that they didn't have any local police departments, which is why the reason we went there. Rather than going to a big, huge office in a big city where as soon as you hand over a note or walk in with a gun, the police are going to be there in two or three minutes, we decided to go to these rural towns. And you, you did have a gun. I had guns in all five robberies. Yeah, but they, but they were fired? No. So that probably helped with your sentencing maybe a little yeah, bit? Yeah, helped a, helped a little bit. If they had been fired, I think I would still be in federal prison. Uh, you discuss how is the – so your friend Tom, he only did the first one. He was a very old childhood friend of yours. Yep. And then you – but you kept going. And it seemed like you got more care. I was an careless. overachiever. Yes, yes, just like you are today. Yes. <laughs> so maybe you're not exactly not the same person. You still go all the way when uh, when when need, when the call comes. So you kept going, and it got you got more careless the way you describe it. Very careless. Um, I, I you know I was never under any illusion that we weren't going to get caught. That's an interesting point of this. He's just like I'm going to do this until I get caught. I just kind of knew that this was eventually going to end, and that kind of tells you where my mind state was. My thought was. When they come to get me, it'll probably be a shootout. I'll be dead, and therefore I'm not really worried too much about the consequences. And you know, when you don't care about the consequences of your actions on yourself, it's really easy to forget about the consequences of your actions on others. How much money did you steal? I think all together it was 175 thousand over five banks. Did you like live high on the hog? Well, <laughs> well, it's it's much easier to spend money when you don't earn it. Uh, and yes, we just it was a nonstop party for a year. Um, every stupid thing that you could ever think to buy, we bought. Uh, and I don't know where my friends and and people I was around thought the money came from because they saw me living a lavish lifestyle and not working. Uh, so I knew it was going to come crashing down at some point. So when you were caught, you you didn't get a trial. It was like as most prisoners do not get a trial. You pled to a lo I mean, is unarmed robbery? Did you plead to? Pled to unarmed robbery and then the use of a firearm during one of the robberies. Okay. And if I had pled guilty to one more firearm charge, uh, people think the bank robberies is what I got the time for. I got seven years, three months for the banks. I got five years for one gun. If I had been charged with use of a firearm during the other four robberies, I would have been looking for just the gun charges at a mandatory minimum sentence of 85 years. Jeez. And 
you then found yourself in Illinois, interesting, I guess. Yeah, federal prison in Illinois. Nebraska doesn't have a federal prison, so. And it was it wasn't it wasn't maximum security. It doesn't sound like from the book. No, it was a medium high security, so one level down from maximum. So what does that mean in practice? <sighs> um, well, a little less violent. Uh, it was a place where there were people with outdates. Um, most of the people in the max, <laughs> they may have an outdate, but an outdate that's 40 or 50 years away or several life sentences. Uh, so there were people with outdates at my prison, which meant that there was a little less violence because people eventually wanted to go home. Um, but for the most part, it was it was prison kind of like what people think prison is like. And there were a lot of boredom, a lot of violence, and your movements controlled in every single way. What is the uh, first night in prison like? Uh, just <laughs> not a lot of sleep mm -hmm. uh, because you don't know what's going to happen the next day. And you kind of just takes a while to figure out what prison is like. And you don't ever really feel comfortable in prison. Plus, you don't really want to, because if you do feel comfortable in prison, that probably means that's where your focus is rather than on getting out. Um, but it's, it's not a place where there's a lot of peace. How did you end up getting into, I mean, being a jailhouse lawyer effectively? Bad luck. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I got a job in the prison law library so that I could get out of the kitchen where I was scrubbing tables, which wasn't much fun. And the kitchen's one of the most dangerous places in the federal prison because even though there are prison guards watching, there are things like knives <laughs> and all sorts of things you can use as weapons. So I got a job in the prison law library, and for the first six months there, I wanted nothing to do with the law. I just checked out books. When I did pull down one of those books, you know, they were big and intimidating and thick. And when I did read them, it felt like they were written in another language. And I didn't think much about having a career in law. And then June 26 of 2000, the Supreme Court handed down a decision called Apprende v. New Jersey. And I, along with every other federal prisoner in the country, thought maybe this could lead to a sentence reduction. And all of a sudden, I had a lot of motivation to try and learn the law on my own and try and figure this all out. What is that decision? What did they, what did they say in Apprendi? They said that facts which increase your maximum sentence must be proved to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. And I had pled guilty to unarmed bank robbery, um, but had been sentenced and had my sentence enhanced based on the gun, even though I also got a gun charge. And so my thought was, well, if I had to actually plead guilty to armed robbery to get that enhancement, this violated Apprende. And it turns out I was right, but it took five or six years for the rest of the criminal justice system and the Supreme Court to get there. So by then, it was too late to help me. Because your case was finished. Yeah, because my case was finished. But what I found was I really enjoyed the process of solving these legal puzzles, writing out the solution. And then once I started winning cases, I found out I really enjoyed helping my fellow prisoners get time off their sentence. You didn't have a, a undergrad degree either. I did not. I did not. And but you did I had that. never done any writing other than letters to people uh, when I started this kind of venture. And I just learned by reading lots of good books and lots of lawyers sent in briefs that were really good, people like Seth Waxman, and I just tried to emulate what they did. And Is there, I mean, the success that you had and the, the praise that your legal writing received show, you know, an enormous almost like seemed like natural talent for this stuff. Um, was there a point at which – so you, you started reading the legal stuff and you started doing this for this very practical reason. But was there, there a point at which it kind of ticked over into like intellectual curiosity or you discovered that you also just – had an affinity for it? No, very much so. So I was a solid C student in high school. Uh, did not do very well in part because I didn't really care and it was not interesting to me and not challenging. And the law was challenging from the get-go and I really got drawn in uh, and, and realized that, you know, my writing ability, it took many, many years to get that to where I would be 
proud to say I wrote something from several years ago. But, but as far as analytical ability, I kind of felt like I got that right away. Uh, and I could see arguments, and I could see arguments that lawyers were making that were wrong. And, and most of the cases I won were ineffective assistance to counsel cases where lawyers had made mistakes. When you're in a prison, it seems like, and I think you write in the book that the first year or so, you, you I think you say something like you move past the I don't care about my life stage and you start thinking about a future and, a, and some sort of – it seems that that's – the pro a lot of the problems that occur in prison to, for prisoners it, from violence to um, other types of abuses is because there's no hope or something like that. Did you get hope from the law? Um, and you also, of course, uh, had, were corresponding with your future wife, which yeah. gave you some hope too. Is that was that really important? Well, that that was part of it. Um, it's really hard to get up and kind of seize the day, so to speak, when. You're facing a 20-year mandatory minimum sentence. That in the federal system, you know you're gonna even with good time and good behavior, you're gonna serve 17, 18 years of that. It's really hard, especially for someone that's 20 or 21 or 22, to think, oh, well, I need to be working on myself today to get myself ready for release when the amount of time you're going to serve is equivalent to the amount of time you've been alive. Uh, so it is very hard. But the closer you get to the door, the more you realize, or at least you should realize, that, whoa, i got to start thinking about life on the outside. And for me, I made it through the first couple of years, and then I started winning cases in court and corresponding with my now wife and having a great mentor in Seth Waxman, who was a former Solicitor General of the United States, and all of those things, you know, led me to make quite a few changes. And and the fact I just grew up, you know, I was 22 and 21 when I committed these crimes. By the time I hit 25, 26, 27, I was in a different place, like most young men are. And that's one of the reasons why why these long sentences don't really serve society well, because. People tend to age out of crimes because they just mature, and and everyone knows this intuitively, but the criminal justice system has not really caught up to that. Talk about um, your fellow prisoners. I mean, we mentioned some of them, but if if, if you mentioned, I think in a sort of wonderful way, that you became one of the welcome wagon for the prison. You give new prisoners good bar of soap and uh, you know a toothbrush and things like that. Um, so if, if I was coming in and you were walking me through like a tour guide and saying, "This is these are these people. These are these people." Like how how would you introduce someone to federal prison? Yeah, so that's a really interesting thing about prisoners. They're very generous. So when you come in, people did that for me. Uh, somebody brought me. I was going to go take a shower, and somebody stopped me and said, "Oh my gosh, don't walk in the shower barefoot." Like. <laughs> Don't ever do that. <laughs> Here's a pair of shower shoes. Same in the dorm rooms. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't, there are certain things you just don't do. Here's a toothbrush. Here's toothpaste because you aren't going to get to the commissary, the, the store, for several days. And so people did that for me. And it's just you. I would see prisoners constantly returning the favor. Um, some of it was based on race, where you grew up, you know. I, we had a group of guys that were from Nebraska that tended to look out for black or white or Hispanic prisoners, but that they were coming from Nebraska. And so you, what you find is there is a sense of tribalism even in federal prison. And you have to know these rules to, about yeah. where you sit for lunch yeah. and who you talk to and all, the, all these things. And the consequences are so severe. So I reached across to get a cup of milk one morning, uh, reached across someone's tray, so literally put my arm over their food, and the guy wanted to kill me. <laughs> First thing in the morning, said, if you ever do that again, I'm going to take this tray and beat you over the head with it. And you know what? I learned my lesson pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, um, and it's funny because prison there is far more respect for people than I ever see like here on the metro in D.C., <laughs> Uh, where people will almost kill each other for a seat or to get out of a car to go to their important job. Uh, in prison, it's not like that because the consequences of being rude and disrespectful are so immediate and severe. So is that a 
the, I guess the reasons for that? Is that just a factor of there's naturally going to be violent people in prison and so you're just – you know, you just behave this way because you don't know who might be violent. So it's better to just treat everyone as yep. they might be or is it – does it get – do you get acculturated into that? Like so did, did you – or other prisoners who weren't that way come to behave that way over time too. Yeah, I just think think you learn very early on in prison that respect is very important. That's all these guys got. Uh, some of them have no family. Some of them are doing several life sentences. All they have is respect, and you realize really early on that that's how you behave. And if you don't, there are consequences. Um, are there a lot of um, innocent people in prison, do you think? Or, or and I guess it would be a secondary question. Because like, a lot of people might think with the Federal Innocence Project and things like this that there are a lot of innocent people in prison. Do, do you think I that that's true? I didn't see a lot of what you would call factually innocent people in federal prison. But what I saw were thousands of people who sentences were increased based on bogus things. Like back when I was being sentenced, it was mandatory guidelines, mandatory sentencing guidelines. And the only way you really got out of those was if you cooperated. So what would inevitably happen is the people that were cooperating and would embellish drug amounts, make drug amounts up, try and recruit other people to cooperate their story to the prosecutor. And you would see people like my friend John Davis, who I write about in the book, who the police found 0.4 grams of methamphetamine in his house, but he was sentenced to 14 pounds of methamphetamine based solely on the testimony of a bunch of drug addicts uh, who were looking to get their own sentences reduced. And, and if John had been sentenced to the 0.4 grams, he would have done a year or two, but instead he was sentenced to 14 pounds and he was a first-time offender given a mandatory life sentence. He's the one you refer to as hater? Yes. And, yeah. and, and he, at one point, you, he actually confronted one of the I, – I don't know if snitch is the right term – informants or yeah. uh, uh, you, you call voice box. That's a fascinating story. Yeah. So we walked into the cell and John approached this guy and said, do you know who I am? And the guy's like, no. And he's like, really? You don't know who I am? And the, the voice box, because he had his larynx taken out from throat cancer, says, no, I don't think I've ever met you. And John pulls a piece of paper out of his back pocket and says, well, then why did you tell the prosecution you bought two pounds of methamphetamine from my house and you even described my dog at my farm? And the guy started crying and basically broke down the entire story how John's co-defendants had paid him 1000 or $2,000 to cooperate what they were saying against John so that they could all get time off. Because like I said, under mandatory guidelines, the only way people were getting out from under these 10 and 20 and 30 year sentences was to cooperate. And it didn't look like to me at least in Nebraska, that there was a lot of quality control from the U.S. Attorney's Office. And they would just take whatever anyone said and trot them into court. And that's kind of how the system worked. In fact, it was so bad in Nebraska that they had a term for this. It was called jumping on a case, on someone else's case, even though you knew nothing about them. And John is still in prison. And John is still sitting in prison serving a mandatory life sentence. How does that work? So if they find just from the procedural standpoint, so if they find a vanishingly small amount of methamphetamine and that's all the cops have actually found, how do you then argue in court like, well, no, in fact, what he actually had was this amount that we didn't find? Yeah. Well, so they got him for conspiracy and they had – the jury found over 500 grams was involved in the conspiracy, which – the federal system sets the, that, that set a statutory minimum and maximum of 10 years to life. And then the judge back then could find whatever he wanted or she wanted as far as facts that produced a bigger drug amount by a preponderance of the evidence at sentencing. And that's what you got that's what you get sentenced to is is whatever fact finding the judge does then. And, and they brought some of these people out and, and uh, yeah. And you said back then. 
Well, so it's a little different now because there's advisory guidelines. The Supreme Court in 2005 finally bought the argument that I had presented to my judge in 2000 and declared the guidelines unconstitutional. And so now the judges can depart from the guidelines and there's not so much pressure on people to run to the prosecutor to get a lower sentence because they feel like I don't have to cooperate. I can just plead guilty and then try and convince the judge to not send me away for 20 years. Back then, that didn't happen. So you have you've argued quite a lot that it's, these, these sentences are too punitive. They're too long. And that's something that we at the Cato Institute, you know, sentencing reform is an important thing. But is there among the prisoners – so, of course, many prisoners probably think that their own sentences were too long because the the – sorts of things you just described or other factors, but is there a sense among the prisoners that in general criminal sentences are too punitive, too long? Yes. Uh, I, I, I felt that way. I actually, with my 12-year, three-month sentence, felt like I got a pretty good deal when I got to prison and saw all these young African-American men with nonviolent drug cases not involving firearms doing 20-year mandatory minimums for crack cocaine. Uh, I felt very lucky. But you quickly realize that the sentences on the whole are just far greater than they need to be to protect the public. And, uh, you know, one of the things I argue about with people all the time is this notion of general deterrence. Uh, you sentence someone long so that it deters everyone else. I don't think that actually is a thing. And the reason is, I you know, I never met anyone in federal prison who knew the amount of time they were facing. And the sorts of people that commit these crimes are people with drug addiction, alcohol addiction, mental health illness, impulse control issues are all four. So they're not rational actors. But even if they were, to try and figure out the amount of time you would face for a federal crime, you'd have to research and find the one of 5,000 federal criminal statutes, determine the statutory minimum and maximum, and then you'd have to go to a 500-page guideline manual that judges and lawyers misapply every day in federal court. And to think that anyone actually does that and weighs that out before they commit a crime, I just never saw it in 11 plus years of being in the criminal justice system. Well, I, I, do, I do that before I commit every crime. <laughs> I, I got all the law books, every sort of thing put together, a likelihood I know, of being caught. but Jeff Sessions thinks that exactly. the general deterrence, that's why we have to have these long sentences is because it tells everyone else not to do this. And I just have never seen any evidence either empirically or anecdotally that says that that actually happens. It seems so nonsensical that it that that's what happens and that these long sentences actually deter people that it to me it just makes it clear that it's not that say someone like Jeff Sessions who you know just last week or the week before ordered federal prosecutors to always seek maximum um, penalties that it's not about deterrence it's just it's like it's punitive it's just it's a you know they just feel like people need to be punished and punished harshly and they want to do it which is also partly why it's hard to argue against it because it feels like so all the, the arguments about it doesn't deter things and it has these terrible effects is like, well, but so what? Because we're punishing them and they deserve it. Well, I, I think there is – I see that a lot too. And I think there is a fundamental mismatch between people that are politicians, lawyers, and federal judges who on the whole, all of those groups of people – are generally rule followers. The problem is they're the ones that set the laws and assume everyone else is going to follow the rules. And the majority of Americans are not rule followers. Walk out into the street and just walk, watch people walk across the street when the sign for not walk is not on, or speeding laws, or any of the other laws. You know, we've got millions of people that use an illegal substance every day in this country. And so there always seems to me to be a mismatch between what someone like Jeff Sessions thinks the world should be and what America is actually like. How did you get involved in your first Supreme Court petition for certiorari? Yeah, so a friend of mine from Nebraska, John Fellers, uh, came to me one day. And, this and is this, in prison. This is in prison. Yes. And, and, you know, I had been self-studying the law for like 18 months at this point. So set the scene where you're in the prison yard. Are We're in people? the prison yard and he comes and says, you know, the A Circuit just denied my appeal. He had gone to trial on a conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine. 
received a sentence that was the same as mine, 12 years. You know, I walked in uh, five banks with guns, got 12 years. He sells a little meth and gets the same amount of time as me. And, and he says, you know, uh, my, I lost in the A circuit. I want to file to the Supreme Court. And I called my lawyer and he says, we've got no chance of winning in the Supreme Court. But as many lawyers like to do, he said, John, if you give me $12,000, I'll throw something together to file in court. And John just didn't think that that was a great idea. But he had to do some convincing because at that point I had filed, I think, one or two habeas petitions. And, and I, didn't, I, I knew enough to know that filing a habeas petition in federal district court is not the same as convincing the United States Supreme Court to take a case. And I was hesitant to do it because I didn't think I could. And John was persistent and I said yes and I spent two months basically working on his case day and night. Uh, and pecked out that petition on a prison typewriter and we sent it off and I largely forgot about John Fellers in his case because I knew the odds were against us and John had transferred to another prison. And one morning I'm walking out to the recreation yard at 6.30 and a friend of mine comes running and screaming out of the housing unit. This being federal prison, the first thing I thought was, what did I say to this guy yesterday? He wants to come <laughs> fight me at 6.30 in the morning. But you don't usually go to a fight carrying a newspaper in your hands. And what he had was a copy of the USA Today saying that the court had granted John Feller's case. How unlikely that was given that he had filed pro se without a lawyer. And it actually quoted from the brief that I had written out on a legal pad and then pecked out on a prison typewriter. And, you know, I had no idea what it would lead to. But it was on the whole as far as prison days go, it was a pretty good day. <laughs> you actually, I, there's a little, you wrote a note on the cover of the brief to the court. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we prepared a cover letter. Um, and I just said, and, and I don't actually have a copy of that, and I don't know if the court does or not. But the letter just said, hey, I know you get lots of these from prisoners all over the country. Most of them have no merit. They're hard to read. But this case actually does have merit. It's really interesting issues. Take a look at it. I have no idea if that played any role, but... I, I think I think it, it could. I've been having... It, we, uh, there's so many pro se, it's, it is... You got to get them to take notice somehow. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's that's the whole ball game up there because they're getting briefs from all over the place, and and you know. So what was the issue in John's case? The issue was the police. The, John had been indicted, which means it started adversarial proceedings, which means his Sixth Amendment right to counsel kicked in. And the police came to his house, knocked on the door. He opens the door, and they say, "Listen, John." We're here to talk about your involvement in a methamphetamine conspiracy. They don't tell him he's indicted. They don't read him Miranda warnings. And then they just sit there as John starts to make incriminating statements. They then arrest John. They take him 20 minutes to the jail. They put a Miranda warning in front of him as they're asking him the same questions they had asked him at the house. And he signs the Miranda warning, repeats the same answers, and that was all used at trial against him. And the question was whether they had violated his Sixth Amendment rights by not reading him Miranda when they arrested him at the house and whether that also tainted the subsequent interrogation at the jailhouse because John thought, well, you know, I let the cat out the bag once. At that point, it doesn't really matter if I invoke Miranda or not, I'm screwed. And so he went forward and the court said unanimously nine to zero that the first interrogation violated his rights. They kicked, they punted on the second issue, sent it back down to the A circuit. The A circuit ruled against John, but why he was there, Booker came out that said the sentencing guidelines were unconstitutional. So he went back for resentencing, and but we lost on the trial issue. And this time, Seth and Wilmer Hale filed the cert petition to the Supreme Court. And the second time, they denied it, uh, which I always tend to remind Seth about. You, know, <laughs> you may have argued 80 cases, but I think I probably, you should let the jailhouse lawyer handle that one. So when, when after the cert petition was granted, of course, lawyers all over would love to take any one of those cases just to argue in front of the Supreme Court. But you you happen to get, as you mentioned, Seth Waxman, who is one of the biggest lawyers in, in town. And then amazingly, you you were 
kind of brought in as co-counsel. You were in jail on conference calls, and they were sending you briefs for comments, but you had to comply with all the weird prison rules. Talk about how, yeah. What was that like? Well, Seth tells it like this. Seth says, federal prisons are very used to lawyers calling in to communicate with their clients. What federal prisons are not accustomed to is lawyers calling the jailhouse lawyer of their client. And so it did present some problems, but we worked through it. And yeah, the the Seth and the lawyers at Wilmer Hale made me a part of the team, and I'm forever grateful because I think a lot of people with Seth's background, you know, Harvard undergrad, Yale Law School, Solicitor General of the United States, I think a lot of people would have said, hey, Mr. Dalehouse Lawyer, great job getting the case granted, but we'll take it from here. And that is the exact opposite of what Seth did. And I found out many years later after I got to meet the people at Wilmer Hale that they actually had a nickname for me. Uh, I was in-house counsel, as in the big house. (laughs) So what kind of, when you were collaborating with them, what kind of work were you doing? You know, probably little of nothing of help to them, (laughs) looking back at it now. Uh, I was just writing notes about, you know, I was, by this point, pretty familiar with the record factually, so I would help with that with some of the legal arguments. I remember at one point they called and we had a conference call with Seth and three lawyers from Wilmer Hale, and I'm on the phone in the office of my prison counselor, and they're asking and saying, you know, arguments next week, are there any questions that you think the justices might ask that we're not thinking about? And I just remember thinking, you know, I've been self-studying the law for 18 months with no undergrad degree, no law school, and here I've got a former solicitor general asking me questions like this. And my response was, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> and of course, that wasn't the first time, though, because then you had a second petition. Yeah, the then I had a second petition that was granted, in part because I, the, the lawyers from Wilmer Hale stayed in contact with me long after John Feller's case was over, and so they gave me the heads up that there was another case in the court that was similar to one I was taking up with a friend of mine. And that was because of that that I kind of tied the case I was working on to that case. And when that case won, my guy won and got remanded back. Um, and that was just that was just a, a GVR? Yeah, a GVR. And then I started winning cases kind Grand of. Grand vacated, remanded, by yeah. the way, is what, is what that means. <laughs> yeah, I started winning cases kind of all over. Federal district courts, I won a case in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And in the last couple of years, I was basically running a law firm from prison where I'd have 10 clients at once and one prisoner who woke up every day and basically went and went to the typewriter and typed out briefs that I was so you, had, you, had, you had paralegals and associates yeah, I, working I for you. Yeah, I had a staff. <laughs> so, so who, I, who was your staff? I mean, I just I am like I'm thinking of like prison nicknames. So this is a, you know. So that would have been Glenn. He was a guy from Nebraska in on interesting case because he was a white guy in on a crack case, which I don't think I'd ever seen that happen before. Uh, he and his brother were there, twin brothers from Omaha, and he was good at typing. And so the guys that wanted me to do work would just pay him to type out the briefs so that I could sit in my cell and continue writing. Did you teach other people how to do legal research and things yeah, like that? Yeah, I taught a couple classes uh, in the education department. Um, Prison was a little skittish about that, uh, just because, you know, they want people to learn the law, but not too well. Uh, And one of the things I realized early on was if I stuck with working on criminal cases, the prison pretty much left me alone. Uh, It's when you start suing prison guards on civil rights cases that things can go really bad. I'm curious. So you're you're doing all this legal research and writing. Did you have access to like Westlaw or LexisNexis? I wish. I wish. I probably appreciate Westlaw like no human being on the planet. (laughs) No, it was all books. It was, and it was, you know, it's not an exact science. So, you know, you have to read basically 100 cases for every two that you find that are on point, which is not very effective and not, you know, is very time consuming. But for someone that doesn't know the law, it required me to read a whole lot of law that wasn't relevant to the case I was working on. And I was like a sponge. So it actually, in the long run, made me a really good lawyer. Uh, But I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. You kind of touched on this um, a little bit, but in, in 
it seems that with the stories you tell and you talk about, I think his name's Marvin. Uh, you've uh, Marvin Brown. Marvin Brown. Uh, p- just people in unfortunate circumstances, and and you get the sense, and you've done this so much, but that so many of these people in federal prison are there where, with bona fide legal complaints. I mean, you know, in the sense that there are all these pro se, you know, we know about the prison lawyers and everyone wants to kind of roll their eyes and say, okay, well, you know, you have the hard criminal justice, you know, the hard law and order people saying, oh, well, then the prisoner is going to file like 50 appeals on the stupidest things. But you get this sort of sense that there's a lot of bona fide legal complaints, especially given the fact that public defenders and this just are so strapped for time that they, they overlook things constantly. They are, and, and it takes a lot of dedication to litigate one federal case appropriately. Uh, And Melvin Brown, today, that's still my favorite case I've ever worked on. Melvin came to me two weeks before his habeas petition was due and said, hey, look at this. And he had been sentenced as a career offender at the age of 22. How you're a career offender at 22, I don't know. But he was a young African-American man who'd been caught with like three grams of crack and was given a 16-and-a-half-year sentence in federal prison. And the problem was that one of his prior convictions didn't actually count. And and the career offender was really the – because he pled guilty, that was the only part of the case that really mattered. And the lawyers and the probation office just didn't look at it. And when we filed it, the judge ordered the probation officer to respond first before the the U.S. Attorney's Office. The probation officer just came back and said, we missed it. And the prior lawyer said, I missed it. And then the government came back and filed a one-page response and said, we agree, he needs to be resentenced. And he was resentenced to five years and eight months. And if you hadn't got involved, that would not have happened. He would, he would still be in prison. He's not in prison anymore. He's not in prison anymore. And uh, Do you know he bought me a, a typewriter ribbon and a copy card. $14, I think he said. Yeah, the, yeah. That so was, for that like was... $14, he got almost 11 years shaved off his sentence. How many people do you still talk to from either who are still in prison, I know your friend John, um, or people who, who have been released, do you still make contact? Keep oh, yeah. with them? I'm in contact with quite a few of them. I mean, most of, the, most of my closest friends got out, never committed another crime, never had any problems again, and never went back. Um, there are some that have gone back, but I, I tend to keep in contact with all those guys. You know, I, I lived with them for in a very intimate setting for 10 years. So they are in some ways like family to me. So how did you – I mean your path after prison has been pretty interesting. Also. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so, so what happened after you I'm got just out? a normal law school student. Absolutely, yeah. So what year did you get released? So I got released to a federal halfway house in October of 2008, height of the recession. No one finding work, let alone the guy that just did 11 years in federal prison. And I quickly realized not a great need for knowledge of the U.S. Supreme Court in Omaha, Nebraska, even amongst the lawyers. They just aren't filing many briefs to the Supreme Court. So I couldn't get a job with lawyers or law firms, but I found this job for a document analyst at Cockle Legal Briefs, which is this company that prints Supreme Court briefs for lawyers all over the country. Something I'm... We are very familiar here with at Cato. We, yeah. work, we work with them all the time. I know. I know. That's where I first learned about Cato was working at Cockle. Uh, and I worked there and I worked on a case with a professor from Michigan, Rich Friedman, who was litigating a confrontation clause case. And he asked me one day and said, you know an awful lot about the confrontation clause. You must be a lawyer because this isn't something that one studies for fun. And I said, well, I'm not a lawyer, Rich, and I'll tell you someday but, about my story, but don't freak out. So I wrote him a really long email, told him, and he did freak out, but in a good way. And after he argued his case in the Supreme Court, he told Adam Liptak at the New York Times about my story. Adam wrote a story in February of 2010, and life hasn't been the same for me ever since. But you did end up going to law school. I did end up going to law school at the University of Washington and got a full-ride scholarship through the Gates Public Service Law program there. Uh, And then after that, I went to go clerk for Judge Janice Rogers Brown here in D.C. on the D.C. Circuit. It's it's a a shock. Every 
turn in the story just is gets it's crazier and cra- I mean, having lived it, it must feel that. It, it yeah. feels that way to me. It really does. There are moments I wake up and feel like I can't believe this is happening, and I'm the one living it, and I mean, it's and, unbelievable. And, and there's even a love story in it. I mean, it's it's all it gets. It's 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 unbelievable. And and now you're at. And now I'm at Georgetown at the Appellate Litigation Clinic, which I'm just finishing up a teaching fellowship there, where we have 16 students and we take cases on appointment to the 11th Circuit, the 4th Circuit, and the D.C. Circuit. And I've argued a few cases and, and just a few weeks ago prepared one of my students who argued in the D.C. Circuit before Judge Brown. Um, and, yeah, it's been a, a just... It's one of the funnest jobs I've ever had. Have you in law school and did you do clinic work and stuff to continue helping? Are you still focusing on the pro se kind of side of things? I did. So I did the Innocence Project, but I was I was also uh, moonlighting as an appellate practitioner through law school. I, I did a, wrote a lot of briefs for other lawyers and law firms without my name on I know exactly what that feels like (laughs) because that's what I've been doing here for seven years, yes. I would tell you that there was one cert petition I prepared basically all in class sitting in the back row. Uh, I don't learn very well by lecture, so I would get bored very (laughs) quick, and so I would start writing briefs in the back row and... Not not something I would recommend to my students, but it worked for me. And you also had two kids. I also had two kids. My, My son was born... The first year I was out of prison, and my daughter was born the second day of law school. Uh, and, now, and now my wife's in law school at Catholic University. Oh, really? She went, she, she's now, is she going to try and pursue a similar type of... She is. She wants to work on prisoner cases and criminal cases. Uh, she'll probably do some appellate work with me, and yeah, it'll be good times. So what is the plan uh, at Georgetown? You, you, will you be pursuing helping build out the... Awareness I mean, is that part of this clinical stuff or awareness of the plight of prisoners in the pro se world? Yeah, so I'm getting ready right now to make the transition from clinical faculty to full time tenure track faculty, which means I'll be writing a lot fewer briefs and writing more law review articles. Uh, but Georgetown was pretty aware of what I wanted to do when they hired me, which is teaching and writing scholarship is one component. The other component is sentencing reform, especially federal criminal justice reform, since Georgetown's literally three blocks from the hill. And then if there are opportunities for litigation where I feel like I can make an impact, I will continue to do some of that as well. I really enjoy arguing appellate cases on behalf of one client, one criminal defendant. And so I don't think I will ever fully get away from that. Did you ever consider becoming an attorney, a defense attorney in the private sector? No. I thought about becoming a public defender, uh, but I worked for the Federal Defender's Office in Seattle one summer, and I really enjoyed the work, but what I realized was it was really hard on me to go to sentencing and be seated next to the client because I know, unlike everyone else in that building, exactly the sort of punishment that client's going to face and that it doesn't end once they're done with prison. You know, I when we moved from Seattle to DC, I was denied my whole family was denied apartments at various places and because of my felony background. So I know the punishment these men and women are facing and it was just really hard for me to do that day in and day out. What do you think most people should realize about the criminal justice system that they don't currently realize? How completely arbitrary it is, uh, especially the federal system. Who gets charged federally and who doesn't is completely arbitrary. And then even built within that, there's a lot of arbitrariness about how Congress writes statutes. I just wrote a law review article on this about how many of them are vague and ambiguous and courts tend to always expand statutes to cover the crime rather than narrow them. Um, And so there's just a lot of some of the people that get caught up in it aren't much different from the person that gets charged in state court and gets a year or two in prison and is released, and the person charged in federal court does 10 or 20 years. And what do you think people can learn from your story? Well, what I'd tell them is everyone goes through pretty profound changes between the ages of 20 and 40. Like 20 when I committed the crimes, 40, I'm now dad, husband. And if we know that, we know that people make 
profound changes. Why do we think prisoners can't? And, and if the answer is, one, people that commit crimes are inherently evil, then we have to root out that fallacy. If the other answer is, well, the prison system makes it so people can't be redeemed because it makes criminality worse, not better. Well, then that says something not about those individuals, but about our criminal justice system and its failings. Do you think that there are meaningful opportunities in now for reforms, for criminal justice reforms? I mean, I, Session seems to make it harder, um, but do you think that – are you optimistic at all? I am, especially at the state level, because I think a lot of the states have had success in paring back their criminal justice system, while at the same time, their crime rates have not gone up, which is always – you know, I don't think there's a great correlation there, but politicians tend to look at things like that and make the correlation regardless. And so I do think that – I don't think this administration is going to put much of a dent in that. On the federal side, I don't know. I mean – Part of me thinks with Sessions as Attorney General, it will be hard. But on the other hand, at least he's not still in the Senate. So, you know, he, he kind of killed the bill the last time around, and at least he won't be there anymore. And I'd like to think that if people just understood it a little better, that they would realize that this is kind of a win-win for everyone. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.